morning, everyone. So we are uh, now on uh, parallel session number two, research expertise cluster six and seven, which is about advances in materials and manufacturing, bionic technology, environmental science, transportation dynamics. My name is Michael Francis Benjamin from the University of Santo Tomas, and I'll be your moderator for this session. So uh, while we are still waiting for participants to join, uh, we are glad uh, that you are here uh, joining us uh, in this uh, REC uh, 6 and 7 parallel session. So uh, while we're still waiting for our keynote speaker to join and uh, some other uh, speakers are having uh, difficulty in their laptops, in their connectivity, so we have to proceed. So we have uh, one keynote speaker and other four uh, oral presenters for this session. So, uh, and then we have a, uh, a Q and A towards the end of the session. And uh, to start with, uh, we will start with a uh, third speaker. So, uh, okay. So our speaker is a full professor in the Department of Biology at the De La Salle University in Manila, Philippines. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry, cum laude, and a Master of Science degree in Chemistry, both in BLSU. In pursuit of his academic journey, he was awarded the prestigious Japanese Government Scholarship and completed his Doctor of Philosophy in Chemical Sciences at Hokkaido University in 2014. Currently, he serves as an academic editor for the journals PRJ, Material Science, and Network Modeling Analysis in Health Informatics and Bioinformatics, published by Springer and Index and Scopus. Furthermore, he serves as the vice chair of the Chemical Science Division of the NRCP or the National Research Council of the Philippines, showcasing his dedication to the advancing scientific knowledge within our country. And in 2018, he received the honor of being admitted as a full member of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And uh, some of his recent, uh, recent awards include the 2020 St. Miguel Febres uh, de Cordero Pillar of Sa Lasallian Excellence Award in Research given by the Lasalle University and the 2019 ASEAN Youth Eco Champions Award given by the ASEAN Environment Ministers. Friends, colleagues, let us welcome our speaker, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jose Isagani Hanayro, Department of Biology, De La Salle University. He will be talking about probing peptide metal interactions for the bio nanotechnology applications through machine learning. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Dr. J.I., let me now share your video. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. So please allow me to share a pre-recorded uh, uh, lecture. A pleasant day to everyone. I am J.I. Hanairo of De La Salle University, and I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present the work that I have been engaged with for over a decade. My presentation will show the different applications of machine learning in studying various biomimetic systems. Biomineralization is the biological process in which organisms produce inorganic structures that are critical for their survival. Eggshells, teeth, even the magnetosomes of magnetotactic bacteria are produced through biomineralization. Inspired by nature's remarkable ability to create nanomaterials, peptide-mediated biomineralization was developed as a biomimetic approach to create functional inorganic nanomaterials. Peptide-mediated biomineralization relies on metal-binding peptides to direct nucleation and growth of the material. As depicted in this image, peptides depending on their sequence can bind to specific facets in the growing nanoparticle thus controlling their growth, shape, and morphology. If you're interested to learn more about this technique, my book is a good place to get acquainted with this topic. One of the active areas of research in peptide-mediated biomineralization is elucidating factors that have a huge influence on the nanomaterial synthesis process. 
the end goal is to optimize the process in order to create highly functional materials. The peptide sequence and, and metal equivalents were some of the earlier factors that were established to influence biomineralization. Another intrinsic factor that governs biomineralization is the peptide conformation and assembly, wherein we previously showed that controlling the peptide assembly can lead to varying forms of nanostructures with different catalytic activities. In this work, we attach a palladium binding peptide to a protein scaffold, the tetramerization domain of the tumor suppressor P53 protein, so that the metal binding peptide is spatially fixed. As depicted in this slide, the spatial effects biomineralization peptide facilitated the creation of 3D nanostructures with the highest catalytic activity compared with the other systems. The reason behind the impact of a spatially fixed peptide assembly on biomineralization is binding affinity. The binding affinity of the biomineralization peptide towards the inorganic surface is an important property related to the peptide's ability to create nanostructures. In one of our past works, we showed that the peptide orientation directly influences the binding affinity of a metal binding peptide to a particular surface. For example, when the silver binding peptide is arranged in a tetrahedral orientation through a scaffold, its affinity for and specificity for nanoplates is increased almost twofold. Apart from the intrinsic factors that influence biomineralization, extrinsic factors are also important to consider. In this past work, we showed that the buffer type has a tremendous effect not only on the resulting nanomaterials but on their catalytic activity as well. The past slides were shown to provide a glimpse of how beautifully complex biomineralization is. The biomineralization toolkit has a lot of factors that can be tweaked and optimized and this can be considered something both as a blessing and as a curse. This is a good opportunity for the integration of machine learning since machine learning can extract meaningful patterns from data and can generalize these trends. In one of the earliest works on the application of machine learning on biomineralization, I created support vector machine and support vector regression models that can predict the binding affinity of a given peptide towards gold. Binding affinity, as I have shown earlier, is an important parameter to consider and having the ability to predict it brings a lot of value in research. By using peptide descriptors or variables that are based on the peptide sequence, relationship between the peptide sequence properties and binding affinity was established. It was found that Kidera factors, specifically those uh, related to the extended structure preference, partial specific volume, flat extended preference, and the pKa of the C-terminus, of the peptide can be used to describe the variability of the peptide binding affinity. The main limitation of this paper is the population used to create the model. Data availability is immensely scarce in this domain, which is why only less than 100 peptides were used for training and testing the model. Another limitation of the paper is that it has poor model interpretability. SVM can be considered as a black box wherein we have little information on how predictions are made. To address this, colleagues from the Chemical Engineering Department of DLSU developed an enhanced hyperbox classifier which I applied to biomineralization peptides. The hyperbox classifier operates similarly to SVM wherein decision boundaries are created to segregate a data cluster from another cluster. In contrast to SVM, however, the output of the hyperbox model is a series of rules which clearly articulate the decision-making process. In 2020, I stumbled upon this 2017 paper that reports the binding affinity, uh, that re indirectly reports the binding affinity through fluorescence intensity of 1,720 decapeptides or peptides with 10 amino acid residues. I was filled with joy. I was very happy because this means I can create a machine learning model with a relatively large data set. This can directly address the main limitation of my 2019 paper, which is population size. 
I created a machine learning classifier using 1,720 examples, and the outcomes are more or less aligned with my 2019 paper. SVM appears to be a good algorithm to model peptide binding affinity, and the important predictors are also consistent with some of the predictors I previously used. In addition, I used a permutation-based method for determining variable importance, which revealed that peptide hydrophobicity is the most important predictor. This is consistent with the knowledge that peptide interacts with water molecules prior to surface binding. The performance of the model on the test set is good, characterized by an accuracy score of 80% and F1 score of 81%. The model has promising utility in the biomineralization peptide discovery workflow, wherein the model can be used for screening. This means that only peptide sequences that were favorably classified by the model can be experimentally verified. This will make the process more resource efficient. Biomineralization peptides are usually discovered through phage display assays. In this method, various peptide sequences are expressed in the virus capsid. The phage is then incubated with the target, in this case a metal surface or a metal nanoparticle. Phages that are bound to the target are characterized in order to determine the specific uh, peptide that is bound with the target. It is evident that this process is demanding in terms of resources and technical know-how. The peptides identified through phage display assay need to be produced, and the common route in which peptides are synthesized is through solid phase peptide synthesis. This method involves the immobilization of a protected amino acid onto a solid support, followed by a series of uh, deprotection and coupling reactions until the desired sequence is reached. Due to the heterogeneous nature of the reaction, a greater molar equivalence of the reactants is required in order to push the reaction into completion. Thus, using machine learning to minimize trial and error will go a long way in making the overall process more efficient and cost-effective. I'm currently working on uh, applying association rule mining to extract sequence rules for biomineralization peptides. Association rule mining is a type of data mining technique wherein the links or associations among items within a transaction are extracted. For example, given you purchase from a grocery, which is called a transaction, uh, links among the items you purchase can be established, specifically as represented in this uh, image. So this is a uh, network of the rules. Uh, if you purchase milk, so for example, this is milk, uh, based on the association rules, if you purchase milk, then you are also more likely to purchase cereals as well. The association rules can be used for classification, and we call that classification based on association or associative classification. In this case, we can apply this method to find associations among the amino acid composition of the biomineralization peptide and its binding affinity. Uh, for example, if we're going to take a look, take a look at rule number one, uh, it means that decapeptides that have tryptophan residues at the C and N termini are most likely to be high binding affinity peptides. These rules were extracted from 860 peptide sequences. Taking a closer look at the rules and we can see two interesting results emerge. The first interesting rule is related to composition. Examining the extracted association rules reveals an interesting trend wherein tryptophan and arginine residues appear to be important amino acids in differentiating the binding affinity of gold binding peptides. These results are actually consistent with the current understanding on the nature of peptide metal interactions wherein these residues are involved in peptide binding. For example, the indole functional group of or the indole side chain of tryptophan is known to bind strongly with metal surfaces. Thus, the rules extracted are highly plausible and conform to what we know. The more interesting result is actually related to position. Based on the frequency of appearance in the extracted rules, 
positions 2 and 4 within a decapeptide were frequently and exclusively involved in rules for the classification of high binding peptides. Why are these results interesting? The exact position within a biomineralization peptide has a significant impact on the nanostructure and can be used for finer nanostructural control as, demon de as demonstrated by researchers from the University of Pittsburgh. In, they, in their paper, they found that the fourth position in the A3 gold binding peptide can be used for such regulation, changing the chemistry of the amino acid at this position from hydrophilic to hydrophobic can lead to the formation of a very different uh, gold na nanoparticle morphologies. This highlights that the precise placement of an amino acid is crucial for biomineralization. Contextualizing this result, it is indeed very exciting to further probe what will happen to a decameric gold binding peptide if the amino acid composition is systematically studied at positions 2 and 4. We may see similar results as what was shown in the previous slide, wherein we can use these two positions to control nanostructure growth. Some other works I have done that are relevant to peptide-mediated biomineralization include the creation of an artificial neural network classifier that can predict the stability of the oligomerization state of proteins. Considering that the overall conformation and structure of the biomineralization peptide has a tremendous effect on the produced nanomaterial, predicting protein stability will be important in selecting the appropriate peptide. In another work, I created a regression model that can predict the reducing ability of peptides. For biomineralization, some peptides can reduce metal ions, which directly influences nucleation. The end goal for all these endeavors is to enable rational peptide design, specifically designing peptides with targeted uh, properties. Currently, biomineralization is dependent on combinatorial approaches. A metal binding peptide is discovered, then characterized. For rational peptide design, the intended properties guide how the peptide will be created. We are still a long way from achieving this, but uh, these models lay the groundwork for the realization of this ambition. Before I end my talk, I would like to thank the, the following people. First, I would like to thank Professor Sakaguchi, my uh, PhD supervisor at Hokkaido University, for the guidance and for introducing me to this very exciting field of research. I am very grateful to Sir Frumko, of the Mathematics and Statistics Department of De La Salle University, my statistics prof in grad school. He is very generous of his time and was very patient in teaching me these uh, data science techniques, which I have applied to my material science research. Finally, I would like to thank DOST Preshard for the Coursera Data Science Scholarship, which enabled me to learn the basics of data science and R. With that, I'd like to end my presentation and I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Doc J.I., for that uh, interesting uh, presentation. We'll have the uh, Q&A part later. So uh, good news is that we have uh, with us our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Advincola. Uh, can you just give us a sign if you're ready or we can proceed with one of, with one of the speakers? Um, I'd be happy to proceed now. I'm okay, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm in sir. Singapore, actually, and there's a... Uh, talk uh, in about 30 minutes. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, your turn up. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, and I really apologize for um for this. No worries, I'll just uh, arrange the slides for a moment. Right. Okay. So uh, I uh, think... For a moment, sir. For a moment. Uh, in the rest of time. Okay. You may proceed, sir. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip a lot of slides and um, I apologize for uh, doing this because I understand I only have 15 minutes for this talk, right? 15 minutes, right? Uh, so you have 20 minutes for the okay. keynote speech. Okay, a little. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you all. And uh, 
It's a wonderful opportunity always to be at the APAMS meeting. Unfortunately, uh, I am in Singapore for another meeting uh, and my talk will be in, in about 30 minutes. So no more than that. But I, I will report to you um, things we've been doing in terms of additive manufacturing and uh, AI uh, or direction AI. And if you have not heard about the Additive Manufacturing Center, this is a good opportunity. So I'm with the Oak Ridge National Lab uh, right now and the University of Tennessee. And I'm a group leader at the Center for Nano-Based Material Sciences. And I also have my lab at the Institute for Advanced Materials and Manufacturing. And uh, our research work is mostly involved with uh, interfacial chemistry, nanomaterials, and you can see here my group of students, PhD students, undergrads, and postdocs. And uh, so we do a lot of things related to translational research. Uh, when I define translational research, you want to do something uh, that um, really somebody is willing to pay for because you have the right um, value chain or performance cost ratio. And this is uh, applied science or engineering, and I've had my share on fundamental research, um, but these days we do a lot of this uh, applied research. Um, so let me skip uh, a number of them. Uh, when we th think and talk about plastics and polymers, uh, we overlook how much it has impacted our society or everyday things. Unfortunately, um, the uh, what is missed here is the science and the beauty of uh, uh, designing molecules and materials with the right properties, okay, and even nanomaterials. And we derive plastics mostly from uh, fossil-based fuels. So when we talk about oil, uh, we might as well talk about plastics, okay. So uh, in the Philippines, we are a little late in this game, but uh, we're catching up and hopefully uh, we know how to use it. Unfortunately, when we hear about plastics, the first thing comes into our mind is pollution and uh, rightfully so. Uh, there's been big mistakes and hopefully uh, recycling, upcycling and correct it. Uh, unfortunately, the nature of plastic is that it is really a linear economy, unlike uh, metals or glass or other recyclable materials. We are far from that. In fact, one of the biggest damage to the Philippines is the absence of incineration. Uh, yes, it is, because incineration is a valid pathway towards uh, you know, using waste. And in fact, you can derive fuel from waste through incineration, but it's, it's banned in the Philippines. And uh, there's very few countries who banned it, even Japan, Korea and uh, many other industrial countries use incineration. And uh, recycling is a path. Uh, unfortunately, the, the cost of recycling is not lucrative when the cost of virgin plastic is uh, cheap, okay? So um, why am I pointing this? Well, uh, we do a lot of 3D printing. Um, Back in 2016, I, I gave the value chain of 3D printing as that of um, things you can do leading to high performance in the many applications in the biomedical field, uh, robotics, uh, even manufacturing outer space. And uh, really, uh, this is high time for uh, the Philippines to emphasize on this. Uh, what I like about additive manufacturing is that you can be inspired by nature you can mimic nature or you can look at uh, different types of manufacturing all the way to nanoscale, okay? Biomedical devices. Uh, in fact, what I learned is they do a lot of 3D printing for temporary crowns <laughs> in the Philippines, which uh, is not temporary anymore. Some of those uh, crowns and uh, dental procedures, actually uh, people use them based on 3D printing. Uh, here, uh, you can see 3D printing goes into automotive aerospace. Uh, uh, here is a real Jeep that runs that was 3D printed at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, So let me skip a number of these intro slides so I can have some more meat uh, later. Uh, in the case of 4D printing, this is where you build the material properties based on the uh, geometry. 
and the combination of both allows you to unlock the value of stimuli responsive materials on manufacturing. Okay, so the bottom line is uh, this is here to stay and it will impact the way we manufacture goods and uh, offer services in the Philippines. So where complexity uh, in material properties are an, an advantage, this is where 3D printing shines, okay? So again, let me skip a number of these uh, slides. Um, so the value chain of plastics is that you need to upcycle them, not just recycle, but upcycle them. Meaning you have to derive uh, useful uh, chemical intermediates or high value um, goods or manufacturing methods uh, based on recycled or plastic or bio-based um, materials as well, okay? And this is where our research has taken us for many, many years um, based on the use of nanomaterials, nanocomposites to fend the properties of these 3D printed materials. And we've been doing this for the last um, eight years, okay? Uh, for example, uh, polyurethane can be um, loaded with graphene and be made useful for biomedical applications. So the I'm just going to show the result that uh, based on the composition and percolation threshold, uh, we can come up with the optimum property based on as little as 0.5 weight percent graphene oxide. So. That's really the role of nanomaterials. You add so little and they do so much. And furthermore, uh, this is uh, bioactive or rather biocompatible uh, that it can be used for implants, okay? So let me skip some of this. Uh, I apologize again that this is a little dizzy, okay? Um, <clears throat> and I wanna I show some examples to you of how we have uh, appended nanomaterials based on what would have been normally waste materials, okay? And, and therefore use it, and um, perhaps quite useful in the Philippines. So for example, uh, nanocellulose, which is the breakdown of fibrillar structure in plants, uh, can be a good source of nanomaterials. These nanocrystals uh, can be isolated and then mixed with the resin used for 3D printing. The idea is we can use commercial resins, add this nanomaterial, and then 3D print them using photopolymerization. So this is a movie from a Formlabs printer. Uh, and you can imagine the uh, composition of uh, the material and we add various amount of the uh, nanocellulose. So, Again, uh, the point here and, and very consistently is you only add 0.3 weight percent in order to more than double the, the tensile strength, the elongation, uh, and the fracture energy. And uh, this is a good use of what might even be produced in the Philippines. If this is a high value additive and we can derive it from abaca, from coconut, from banana, from uh, bamboo, then uh, Philippines can manufacture nanomaterials that can be used for 3D printing. And here is, for example, a, a device. So we can go to prosthesis or thesis devices uh, based on bio-based materials, okay? So let's look at another um, material, okay? Or, or maybe another source of polymer based on waste. And this has to do with shrimps. I mean, I, I can eat one kilo of shrimp in one sitting. That's how much I love to eat shrimp. Fortunately, we don't utilize the shrimp shells. Uh, we just throw them away. But actually, it's a big source of chitin, which is then converted to chitosan, uh, a biopolymer, by the way, a uh, bio-based polymer that is useful for many applications. So what we did is we isolated the chitosan uh, and then we used surfactants to disperse them. Uh, however, these are not nanomaterials. 
Uh, and we had to use up to 8%, 6 to 8% to really observe uh, an improvement on property. I mean, they are useful, but they only have to use a lot. But then also we don't have to convert them to nanocellulose. So the story here is without that high value adding, just using or the economics of uh, just using the uh, <clears throat> kyrosan itself, you have to use more. However, uh, and here you can see uh, how beautiful the prints are. However, if you do a little um, modification in the procedure, let's say you convert this into nanomaterials, and then you uh, derive them with acrylates, uh, they can then be mixed with the resin uh, photopolymerize. Uh, and here you see the nanomaterials that are derived from chitosan. And then here, as little as 0.5 weight percent uh, doubles the tensile strength. And uh, the fraction uh, uh, is little compared to 8 weight percent. And you can see the increase in the tensile properties with 0.5 weight percent. So, so the story again here is consistency that nanomaterials or high value adding of nanomaterials uh, and then using this properly as a composite additive unlocks its value, okay? All right, so uh, let with the remaining time, let me tell you about the additive manufacturing story in the Philippines. And I've been training uh, a number of Filipino students, PhD students through the years. Uh, I've been training them how to look at doing good science so that they can develop good technologies, okay? Let me skip the slides. And I have been training a number of these students actually through the years, uh, students who are skilled in interdisciplinary research, multidisciplinary uh, collaborations, uh, and even entrepreneurship. Uh, and we all hear about Industry 4.0. So where does AI come in? Well, AI, as uh, described earlier, or some of you will uh, realize in this uh, symposium, is a tool. It is a tool. Uh, um, that is, you have to use it properly and strategically or tactically uh, to the domain, whether it's a science domain, engineering domain, or financial domain. If you do that, then there are basic things. Uh, one is it's, the foundation really is not far from what you've taken all the way to high school, which is statistics. So if you're able to use statistics, design of experiments, Taguchi method, Weibo uh, function, uh, this is already the start of machine learning. And being able to optimize all these experiments means rapid uh, uh, discovery or optimization procedure. Now, what would be things that in the future could come would be based on generative learning, deep learning, and the application of more sophisticated algorithm, including neural network development. But we're far from that. But uh, I just want you to be aware that it can lead to that uh, in the future. What is very important is the creation of digital twins. And this is usually uh, simulation based. Uh, in terms of molecules or materials, it has to start from atomistic to coarse green methods or the application, let's say, of density functional theory and uh, semi empirical ab initial simulation, all the way to digital twin components in engineering processing, which is process design, which is what they teach in chemical engineering courses. So you'll end up with the workflow. <clears throat> the workflow can be guided by the digital twin. You need to rely on good data. That initial data is your training data set. And then you start with an algorithm and then you develop a feedback loop mechanism for optimization. this feedback loop mechanism that can uh, go through several series or layers of training. The point is the tool here becomes a good way to um, create a workflow for optimization uh, uh, and scalability, okay? So in a manufacturing environment, this goes with production, uh, testing, failure analysis. So manufacturing simply means you have to apply AI to reduce the number of defects, to reduce the amount of energy for manufacture, uh, different types of design, design parameters, and that's where 3D printing shines. 
as I've shown you earlier, you have the opportunity uh, to optimize uh, with, based on design, but also you have the ability to optimize based on materials. Okay. And so uh, we have to leapfrog uh, many countries. We have to bring the best technologies to the Philippines to influence manufacturing. And this is really where I'll end up by showing to you how it can be done. You see, I've been doing it consistently through the years. Uh, uh, this is a picture almost uh, 10 years ago uh, that I've trained many uh, students from the Philippines to get their PhD with me, do sabbaticals, and you know they would go home. A lot of them would actually stay, and that's fine. It's their choice, but the goal really is to equip them. And uh, doing so uh, has been a consistent story in my engagement, uh, going to the Philippines numerous times, uh, giving lectures, but also helping labs, set up labs. And uh, in fact, a, a interesting contribution I did was to set up the entrepreneurship curriculum on the engineering schools. I was the one who uh, helped uh, prepare the CHED memo which required all engineering students to have a course on technical entrepreneurship. And uh, 2014, I started training uh, people who will go into 3D printing. And this is how I start. I don't uh, look at capital equipment as a major contribution. I look at, at human capital uh, training as the real investment, because if you do so, you're able to multiply yourself, your methods, uh, and the science that goes along with this. So this is 2014. Uh, I would even go to the Philippines and bring uh, my students uh, through Engineers Without Borders, you know, an experience that they, uh, the students have. And this is my time with Case Western Reserve University. And then finally, in 2019, they completed My lab, they have state-of-the-art machines, methods, characterization methods, materials development. In fact, I'm in Singapore right now. And you can boast that the Philippines is second only to Singapore when it comes to 3D printing, simply because of this massive training and investment that was started back in 2014. And in this lab, uh, we have the state-of-the-art equipment and uh, access to it. Uh, this was even used to 3D print the first statue of Rizal uh, oh, in the Philippines. The statue itself is about 12 foot, and this is based on plastic, not cement, plastic. Okay, what you see uh, on the background is a 3D printed statue from a digital file of an original sculpture. Uh, and so, well, in closing, I want to emphasize that the opportunities for the Philippines to uh, go to advanced additive manufacturing artificial intelligence is today is here and it will in it will and should influence many manufacturing methods we have i emphasize manufacturing based on tooling uh, or making the machines that make the machines not making the the products from the machine itself I, the reason i do this is emphasizing how germany or japan would emphasize on making machines that they can sell or export and this is really one of the best ways we can increase the value of what we produce in the philippines by exporting machines themselves okay and uh, here are some of the industries so with that i'd like to um, stop here and you know there's time i'll be happy to answer any questions uh, if not i'll just proceed to my talk uh, thank you, Dr. Adinkola. I think uh, our speaker uh, deserves a uh, big hand, so let us give him a uh, virtual uh, applause. Okay, thank you for this uh, very uh, relevant talk. Uh, siguro po, sir, uh, one question is that um, how can you convince probably students to uh, to uh, take this research or to be interested in uh, additive manufacturing. So what can you say uh, to them um, or how can you encourage them? Yeah, I mean, um, a road show or, you know, venues to give talks to universities. But 
uh, actually, I, I'm one step ahead. Um, last week, I was in Manila. I was invited by DOST SEI uh, to give a talk before 2,000 students, scholars, um, uh, DOST-funded scholars on their exit conference at PICC. And I told them how AI and additive manufacturing will get into. The other is referral. The other is really uh, trying to make students feel that beyond uh, the conventional jobs, uh, you can go into R&D. So I hope uh, with, with you all who have uh, listened, witnessed to this talk, spread the word that, that I'm looking for a few uh, really good students uh, who want to be to get their training with me and even come back to the Philippines and contribute to um, this uh, emerging manufacturing field and science endeavor. Thank you, sir. So what about uh, from the other participants in this uh, session? Do you have questions? You may type them in the chat box or simply unmute yourself. Uh, sir, what about uh, convincing uh, our politicians or those the government are we i mean are is the government doing enough to support such uh, research or at least the uh the the trend is it uh, uh is the budget going up in this uh type of research or yeah i i, I think so um uh, it's never enough but um we started this by really working with usd with uh oh, at that time my partner uh, is Yusek Guevara, Rowena Guevara. We actually conceived this back in 2015. And of course, the support from DOSD. So we were able to get about 500 million pesos to set up the center. And then right now we got another 500 million to run it on the second phase. So about a billion investment. But really, uh, a place like this, uh, which is a world-class center, uh, should even be more visible and, and we should invite more politicians to come to uh, this center and convince them that this is the future and you know this is a worthy of an investment for advanced uh, manufacturing uh, and and I think uh, I'm talking to all of you uh, be good ambassadors be whenever you can talk to your mayor talk to your governor and tell them uh, you know we need to invest in science high schools or research centers or we need to provide high value jobs to our kababayans by getting into these industries uh, <clears throat> you have to be economical about this i mean research uh, for the value of research is not good but research for the value of benefiting society whether it's health or especially economic uplift uh, is interconnected i mean i i could talk to you more about science if i want to but I just want you to know that it's high time that we, as you know, members of the scientific community in Paase, be ambassadors uh, for economic development or trans. Better yet, I'll use the word translational research or translational uh, type of um, projects that converts good science into good industries. Thank you, sir. Uh, those are uh, really uh, great insights. Uh, okay, so. Uh... Sir, so you still have one one minute. We'll just give yeah, yeah, the certificate. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah. Do you have any other question, please? Okay, so uh, the certificate of appreciation is uh, awarded to Dr. Rigoberto Advincola in grateful acknowledgement for imparting his valuable knowledge and insights as a keynote speaker in the session 2023 uh, annual Paase meeting and symposium with the theme reimagining the training of the 21st century STEAM workforce held from uh, June 26 to July 1, 2023, signed Dr. Mariano R. Santo Domingo, the PASE president and 43rd APAMS co-convenor, and Dr. Sinia Tigno, 43rd APAMS co-convenor. So again, uh, virtual applause for our keynote speaker. So we are wishing you well, sir, in your talk in a while, and we are great that uh, we're able to uh, join this uh, parallel session. So take care, sir. Yeah, thank you for your patience. And I hope you guys uh, enjoy the conference. Uh, APAMS is a highlight and hopefully uh, you'll meet many friends. Thank you. See you again, sir. Take care. Take care. Okay. Uh, for, the, for this next part, let me sh just share uh, the... Uh, Okay, so uh, 
For this uh, next part, our speaker is an associate professor at the Center for Environmental Nanoscience at the RISC at the Department of Environmental Health Science at the University of South Carolina. He is served as Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Chemistry from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and his PhD in Chemistry from the Louisiana State University. He completed postdoctoral training at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech working at one of the leading air quality labs in the world. Along with his PhD mentor, Professor Barry Dillinger, he contributed to pioneering work on persistent free radicals. And in 2022, he received a prestigious award from the NSF or National Science Foundation Career Award. In 2017, he was among the 30 faculty fellows of the newly launched NSF EPSCOR R2 Track 4 initiative which uh, aims to develop the next generation of U.S. researchers. His main contributions include in the behavior of bioaerosols, and some results have been uh, uh, inputs in the Center for Disease Control and Prevention website on COVID-19, and uh, the Science for Environmental Policy, a publication of the Directorate General Environment, uh, European Commission, highlighted this work on persistent Free radicals, friends. Uh, let us welcome our uh, speaker for this morning to talk about persistent free radicals in leaves. Let us welcome Dr. Eric T. Bihano from the University of South Carolina. Yeah, right, sorry. Feel free to uh, share your work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, okay. So for today's uh, talk, I'm going to present uh, the discovery of persistent free radicals in leaves. So I'm going to tell you the trajectory on how come we started with uh, air pollution, and then we venture to uh, free radicals in the leaves. So first I'd like to thank uh, Professor Barry Dellinger. He died you know, in 2016, but I think he's uh, among the most important person who dedicated his life to studying persistent free radicals. So a lot of gratitude to, to him. And then to Dr. Ang, my uh, previous student, and the funding agency, especially the National Science Foundation. So we started persistent free radical studies with uh, air quality. So I'm an air quality guy, so I study air pollution. And when we think about air pollution, we know we, we focus so much on our, our persistent or on particulate matter. Now, particulate matter is hazardous due to its size per se, and also because of the components that are actually absorbed on the particles itself. Now, most of the studies on health hazards of particulate matter focuses on molecular organic pollutants and not so much on free radicals. Now, the reason for this is that we do not expect free radicals in particles because we think free radicals are just you know, short-lived species. So it started back in 1954 when Ingram published a paper in this journal and in Nature um, showing that there are persistent free radicals in particulate matter, but then it was um, forgotten for so many years and only in 2005 when uh, Professor Dellinger started to bring the aspect of this free radical to environmental uh, domain. So now, just for those who might have forgotten what is a free radical is, so we know it's a molecule or an atom containing at least one unpaired electron. And because of this, um, Free radicals can have lifetime ranging from a nanosecond, such as hydroxyl radical, which is the most important free radical in the atmosphere, as they are the sink or reaction sinks for some of the most hazardous pollutants in the atmosphere. And then you can extend all the way down to environmentally persistent free radicals. So as you can see that as the chemical structure becomes more complex, the radical lives longer, live longer. So the reason for environmentally persistent free radicals persisting is because its interactions with the metal surface, which is um, 
uh, indicated as this bar. So um, these are just uh, free radicals uh, signals in different uh, particulate matter from cities in the United States in comparison to that in cigarette tar. Now, EPFRs, there's, there have been a lot of studies about its health implication, particularly cardiovascular and respiratory dysfunction. And as a summary of the um, numerous studies that has been funded by NIH on the health impacts of free radicals that if you are in the United States, if you inhale PM in the United States in polluted cities like LA, you would at least um, smoke in half a cigarette per day um, just from inhaling uh, particulate matter. And if you're in China, that's equivalent about 10 cigarettes per day. So in the Philippines, that would roughly be closer to the one in China. And this is consistent with the fact that the United Nation has declared that you know, the air pollution is a uh, leading cause of non-communicable diseases uh, compared to smoking per se, and partly because of the contribution of the components in PM in free radicals. Now, so EPFRs are formed um, with this um, conceptual, uh, in this scheme. So you have a support. So EPFRs are formed during combustion, and if you burn anything, you mostly, they would contain metals or in PM, they would have alumina or silica support. And on the surface of those support, then you have had metal oxide nanoparticles. So these metal oxide nanoparticles are like um, an interface for the formation of EPFRs from any sorbing organic molecules. So they are stable and persistent, meaning once they are formed, they do not disintegrate. And they are persistent because they live for like, some of them can live as long as uh, a year. And because of this, they are transported to long distances and therefore exert their uh, hazardous effect because they are not deactivated as uh, molecular pollutants, which is less um, hazardous um, compared to free radicals. Now, that depends on, obviously, on the uh, molecular compound. Now, there are three models of persistent free radical formation. I see models because right now there's no established uh, mechanism for free radical formation, and these are merely conceptual. If you publish one, you can get a paper maybe in science. But so the first one is metal assisted formation, and this is the mechanism that Dellinger and Ingram has a, a thought. The second one is band bending, and the third one is large matrix effect. So the most important uh, one for the first mechanism is that if you have a surface here, which is in this case, is iron, and then you have a phenoxyl, phenoxyl compound served on that one, the metal surface acts as an electron acceptor for the electron from the oxygen and thus forming this persistent free radicals. Now, now the other one is, can we form EPFRs without the support? So what we're trying to do is, we're trying to remove some of these uh, components and can we still form free radicals? So if you remove the support, in this case, you only have a metal oxide, can you form free radicals? And we have uh, made a hypothesis back in 2018 that you can, and it depends on the size of a small of a nanoparticle, and that if the nanoparticle is smaller, it's easier to form free radicals. And if it's larger, it's a lot more difficult to form free radicals. It's because of the potential needed for the charge carrier, in this case, electrons to actually surmount this potential. So this is the band bending mechanism in which the electronic band structures of the material can curve upward or downward, or can actually be lessened depending on the size of the nanoparticle. So what we did again is like, can we form EPFRs without any surface? Like, can you just have an organic to form free radicals? So why not? And the question is, uh, this is because the first synthetic organic free radical was discovered in the 1900s by Professor Gumberg from the University of Michigan and is the father of free radical chemistry. And we know that a pure organic molecule can form, can uh, form persistent free radicals. So in this case, biphenylmethyl radical is stabilized by steric effect. And then in 2018, there has been theories I mean, studies that naphthalene, when converted to secondary organic aerosol with ozone in the sunlight, forms EPFRs. So you do not need a metal support to form free radicals. So 
Um, the study of Dellinger, while very important, I think constrains some of the works on free radicals, in which a lot of people always think about free radicals forming only on surfaces of transition metals. So in this case, it is not really a necessary component to form persistent free radicals. So I thought, you know, there's no other, but if you have to form free radicals, you need to have an energetic photon or an electron acceptor donor processes. And there's no other place to do that, um, but in plants. So we thought that, you know, plants, plant leaves might generate and contain substantial stable persistent organic free radicals because electron donor processes abound in leaves. So if so, leaves are unaccounted source of PFRs. So we just collected leaves, we dried them, and then we subjected it to electron screen resonance spectroscopy. And so this is the result. So these are different uh, leaves of non-senescent leaves. So these are fresh green, lots of chlorophyll in them. So the first one on the top are um, broad leaves. So these are birch, grape myrtle, and red maple. So these are, for those who are not familiar with this, because these are mainly in the United States. So these are broad leaves. And then the lower three, are evergreens, so cedar, pine, puja. So these are needles. Now in both leaves, you can see high signal, or uh, uh, ESR signal, indicating that there is a paramagnetic signal in leaves. Now we're not sure if this is, of course, metals or organic uh, chemicals, or even more so, if this is actually endogenous to the leaves, because leaves can actually intercept um, particulate matter. So it also, we also find it in senescent, found it in senescent leaves. We have high concentration in senescent leaves about two times. And I'll skip that one. So the question now is, are these two, two radicals truly biogenic? So as I mentioned, you know, PM can internalize, leaves can internalize PM and stomata or a cuticular um, incorporation and leaves intercept um, PM efficiently. So what we did is like we covered the, the leaves and then uh, we have two leaves. If you cover the leaves and if this is not uh, biogenic, then we should not see any signal from here. But we can see here from this EPR signal that we still have strong signals for, for all the samples. Now this one, the solid lines are for the uh, covered and the uncovered are the um, the dashed lines. So you can see that there's higher signal in the uh, uncovered leaves, partly because the photosynthetic activity is really high. In the case of the covered leaves, it was uh, the water transpiration that condenses on the wall of the plastic cover reduces the light transmittance. So you can see here that these radicals are actually depends on the photosynthetic activities. So now these radicals, now. In ESR, it's not only, if you have a signal, it doesn't mean it's really from an organic chemical. It can also be metals because metals, some of which are contain um, unpaired electrons and thus ESR active. So we have manganese in plants and that is also shown here by this, uh, uh, what they call this red curve in comparison to the black curve, which is the standard for manganese. But if this radical is from manganese alone, then this signal, which is a very intense signal in the middle, should actually not appear. This should actually be um, equal line intensity. But in this case, it's not. So this is due to an organic radical. So now we have proven that this radical is biogenic, plants created, and it is actually organic and not just because of transition metals or other metals in, in the plants. If you see, if there are other metals in the plant, you should see peaks below this uh, on the left or on the right. So, but right now you can't see any peak, but we still have to confirm this because this study is still preliminary, but um, it is almost established that these radicals are really organic. Okay. So what compounds are potentially responsible for um, stabilizing these unpaired electrons? So, so here we have the unlikely compounds and the one on the right are likely compounds. So these are not chlorophyll systems. So we know that chlorophyll system can also produce ESR signals, but the difference is that they only generate the signal at negative 193 Celsius and when you shine it under uh, with light. 
So in this case, ours is pure ambient. So you just collect, grab, and show, show it in the EPR. It does for the signals. So the most likely candidates are photosynthetic breakdown intermediates. As we have seen that, you know, the senescent leaves, so these are the leaves uh, and during fall, they have higher signals of uh, BPFRs and potentially compounds that regulate stress and senescence, especially photooxidative stress, as we have seen from the covered uh, and uncovered leaves as a confirmation of its uh, endogenous, uh, endogenous origin can, might also be possible candidates for these uh, free radicals and leaves. Now, so we're wondering what is, this is mainly speculative, but I think the main role of this free radical in plants is to actually capture excess electron during photosynthesis. A new study in 2023 published uh, this March showed that we don't know so much about photosynthesis. And uh, while there are assumptions that um, the system here is actually thick, it's about four nanometers and that electrons could not uh, tunnel through this, uh, through these uh, com molecules or this uh, matrix, it's actually not true. It we have shown they have shown that this system are actually leaky, and hence electrons are actually coming out from here, as shown by the use of uh, quinone as an electron acceptor, and that the quinone are uh, accepts electron and does show that electrons are coming out from the system. So if electrons are coming out from the system, the plant has to absorb this. So, so that it lessens any um, stress on the organism. So this is the same as manganese evolved when plants, when the when earth become more oxidative, and that plant has to reduce oxidative stress from the high incorporation from the high amounts of oxygen present in the early atmosphere. So we speculate that this might be the function of plants, and if they do, I think there's very exciting opportunities on and studying what are these compounds and trying to elucidate, is it really that these are its role in plants? Okay. So there are, this is the first study of its kind. There have been a brief mention of ESR signals from plants with increasing superoxide formation, which is attributed to photooxidative stress in plants, but there's no, it's just been a text. There's no other uh, graph or figures to, to go with it. So we also did some studies on persistence and this one, I'll summarize this. What this graph showed shows is that the free radical are sync for free radicals. A zero, so this one would be a flat line. But even after you put this, uh, you do uh, become leaf litter, and after some time, it'll become fine powder and be incorporated in some of the soil particles, uh, so some particles in and in soils. So now the, I forgot to mention that the free radical signal is about lower than those in particulate matter. So this is about a hundred times or two orders of magnitude lower than those on particulate matter. But since we have perpetual supply of leaf litter and leaves account to about 82% of the Earth's land biomass, so you can see that the contribution from this sort can be substantial. Well, if not uh, at the same level as, the, as those in particulate matter. Now, they might be free radicals, they might be persistent, but are they toxic similar to EPFRs? That we don't know. EPFRs has a tandem in tandem with the metal might be more toxic, but BPFRs are not. So we do not know um, if it indeed is very is highly toxic. So anyway, I think it's exciting that this is just barely scratching the surface, but this is the first of its kind of studies or that uh, free, persistent free radicals exist in nature and nature always you know, does it uh, first. So um, future studies, we'd like to identify the molecular structures of these BPFRs and maybe since they have 
potential if this if the hypothesis that they are used for oxidor, counteracting oxidative stress in plants, then that would be a very good uh, uh, medical uh, application for these uh, studies and then investigate their toxicities and elucidate their ultimate fate and transport in the environment and establish the role in plants and the mechanisms by which BPFRs are formed. So I think this is, an, for me, this is, a, I think, my important contribution to, to the field and for my work in air qualities and then find um, trajectory, research trajectory, and identifying that leaves of their own uh, can produce persistent free radicals that might have uh, exciting um, application. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for this, uh, for, for coming to my talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bejerano, for that uh, interesting talk on free radicals, particularly in leaves. So uh, if you have questions, uh, we'll have a Q&A later. But in the meantime, uh, you have to proceed uh, with the next talk. So uh, still have two more, one live and one uh, uh, recorded. So the next speaker received... Uh, his Bachelor of Science degree in Electronics and Communication Engineering and uh, Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of the Philippines, Diliman in 2022, uh, sorry, in 20, 2002 and, 2000, and 2006 respectively. Uh, and he completed his PhD in Electronic and Information Engineering at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Kowloon, Hong Kong in 2021. And his research interest is focused on indoor positioning systems, intelligent transportation systems, and vehicular networks. Friends, let us welcome uh, Dr. Elmer R. Magzino from the Department of Electronics and Computer Engineering, De La Salle University, to give a talk about investigating the mobility dynamics of various transportation modes in vehicular networks. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, you cannot start. Oh, yeah. All right, so I hope everyone can see my slides clearly. And thank you for the invitation in sharing my research. Uh, and uh, this work is uh, a summary or a brief summary of the works that I have done previously. And it's entitled Investigating the Mobility Dynamics of Various Transportation Modes in Vehicular Networks. Again, I'm Elmer Magsino from the Department of Electronics and Computer Engineering Department of Delasol. So the outline of my presentation, I'll give you a brief introduction of what this talk is all about. And we discuss about the various vehicular mobility data sets that I have uh, gathered throughout my study and present you uh, some results and discussion emanating from the data mining obtained from the mobility data sets and provide you with the conclusion and hopefully some of the uh, research tasks that I'll, I'm undergoing. So basically, real-time data exchange between vehicles and roadside infrastructures are now prevalent, especially in other countries. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, we've already discussed or we've already studied uh, uh, autonomous vehicles implemented in some uh, mobile robots. And we all also know that there would be a huge amount of vehicular and environment data and this data would come from various sensors that we already have. Uh, one example would be our mobile phone. And there could be extracted uh, transportation parameters that we can have that can provide movement, comfort, and convenience after all the main importance of uh, transportation in any city or whether it's urban or rural is uh, it's comfortable and it's convenient for us, whether you proceed with public transportation or private. In this presentation, we analyze different empirical urban taxi mobility GPS traces data sets. Although there are there is a uh, software called Sumo that can generate synthetic uh, traces. However, uh, understanding uh, the transportation network of every city would be better understood if we have 
empirical data sets. So the main purpose here is to characterize urban mobility dynamics, such as uh, the basic is to obtain the uh, average vehicle density, the idling time, the travel time. And we could also analyze real world problems from the EV chargers or, or basically the roadside units or the RSU can also be created to the electric vehicle chargers and ride share. So we use extensive simulations and they revealed some similarities and differences among various urban public transport networks. And the results can be utilized by sectors involved in policy making, road network improvement, and environment monitoring. Although in my early uh, career here, I'm not yet involved in any of these uh, sectors. But hopefully in time, uh, the research results can uh, allow other Philippine agencies to use them and implement them. So the GPS mobility data sets that I have used in my uh, study are derived from Beijing, New York, Singapore, and Jakarta. Uh, well, I, I also have the mobility data set of uh, Metro Manila. However, uh, when compared to, the, to these four cities, uh, they, the, the, the Philippine data set lacks many things, okay? And uh, these four uh, data sets here have these common features, the taxi ID, the latitude, longitude coordinates, and the timestamp with varying sampling time. The one that I got from Grab, uh, uh, the Grab taxis for the Philippines is only, uh, they, they only gave me one date, uh, one day, uh, the sampling time is not uh, is uh, set to one minute, but I did not have the taxi ID, so it's very hard for me to to determine the trajectory. And one I did one one important thing for me to study the the transportation network of the of Metro Manila is that I need to get their trajectories. And we mod some an example of the trajectory here is given in blue and in red. So the blue is in cars, uh, for a car, uh, as an example of a car trajectory. And the red here is the, an example of a motorcycle trajectory found in Jakarta. Although in Beijing, New York, and Singapore, we only use uh, taxi trajectories. So the social dynamics, uh, well, the, the way we define social dynamics is that uh, we allow vehicles to talk to each other. In, in simplest terms, vehicles are talking to each other because they will be equipped with communication systems. And another thing that you can see here based on the data mining that we've gathered is that from the pick up and drop off heat maps from the motorcycle and the cars uh, from Jakarta and Singapore. So as you can see here in the left figure, that normally uh, there would be a concentrated pickup place. And in our study here, uh, uh, we can find the we can find the the pick up and the drop off normally from the residential going to their uh, work of place. So, uh, but as we can see here, it's more commonly uh, grouped into a certain uh, spatial location. Now we can also analyze the vehicular movements, and if we let's say allow them to talk, or they can they be allowed to talk within a hundred meter or, or a two hundred meter radius. So transmission, we can see here that uh, given a limited transmission range okay, for the motorcycle interactions, uh, there would be uh, more than, uh, well, for motorcycles, uh, they can only talk to around more uh, around two motorcycles within the two, within the 100 meter range. But for car interactions, okay, as you can see here, uh, we have you can see that the pi is distributed from one to possible possibly ten uh, cars uh, near them. So I, ideally, how do we physically understand them? Is that uh, normally when you have traffic jams, obviously the cars are more packed together. Uh, the way I understand this in in Jakarta is that 
motorcycles have a dedicated lane for them. Uh, unlike in the Philippines that uh, lane speeding is very much rampant for our motorcycles. And this is one of the, I think, one of the disappointments that I have no? uh, been, when you've been to places other than the Philippines. You will see that there's so much discipline. And this data here can provide really that the increase the transmission range to 200 meters, you can now see that the motorcycles can interact to uh, three or more vehicles. So you might be wondering, what's the purpose of this one? Why, why do we need to analyze the social dynamics of or the social abilities of these vehicles? Well, in future transportation networks, when we have autonomous vehicles, they need to to talk to each other and they can they need to send uh, real time data to each other. So therefore, uh, the only way they can talk to each other is that if they are nearby, if they are near to other vehicles. Okay, so this uh, uh, results would give us that the interaction would be very much lifted. In terms of the vehicular dynamics, so so far, uh, we talk about vehicular time travel e uh, efficiency, which covers the idling time and the total time spent during um, the travel or during the journey. So for the TTE uh, between the car and the motorcycle, uh, Jakarta, you can see here that uh, normally, they can have the same time travel efficiency of around 0.8 to 0.9, uh, which uh, tells us that there is still idling time due to some, uh, what do you call this, uh, some stoppage at the intersections. But for the motorcycle, you can see here that there is a second, almost a peak in terms of uh, in, uh, peak value of 0.6 to around 0.7. So, the, the the motors somehow motorcycles since they are very much mobile when compared to cars is that uh the, their idling times can be uh varied. Now in terms of the travel distance efficiency, uh, we define this as the shortest uh this travel distance versus the actual travel distance, and normally the Vehicle and uh, the road networks that we have are grid type. So if we, uh, if the TDE is hundred percent, then we say that the the shortest distance is the one traveled by the actual distance of the uh, taxi, okay, whether it's car, car or by motorcycle. And as you can see here, uh, ninety to one hundred percent. Okay, of the TDE is only seven percent. Whether you you use cars or uh, motorcycles, the thing that we should see here is that the shortest distance is simply the uh, uh, distance measured using the Pythagorean theorem, or the shortest. And while the actual distance normally is, if you're using a uh, the Waze or the Google Maps, normally it will give you the well, it depends on on your on your objective whether it's shortest distance or fastest time. But for this case, we just use the actual distance provided by the data set, and you will see here that more or less, you uh, around fifty percent is sixty percent to uh, eighty percent. Okay, so it would tell us that not bad. Uh, the the road networks are constructed uh, fairly. Uh, fairly enough in order for us to reach our this our destination in the shortest possible distance as possible. Now another application would be the uh, smart parking, and in this presentation only, I'll be presenting the temporal based parking pricing, which is which are commonly used in our uh, uh, parking lots. Huh? The the fixed rate pricing, the linear rate pricing, and we've introduced here the min max rate pricing. And we analyze the temporal based parking pricing based on their effective parking rate. So for here, we can see various uh, uh, 
parking duration. So uh, we, we, we randomly allowed our vehicles to park 1 to 24 hours, 1 to 12 hours, 1 to 4 hours, 12 to 24 hours, 8 to 16 hours, and 20 to 24 hours. We're in the left column, A, C, and E, are short staying parking duration, while B, D, and F are for long staying parking duration. But as you can see here, fixed rate would always be the cheapest effective parking rate. Okay. However, uh, as, as you can see, uh, if you're going to use the fixed rate for long uh, duration parking, then on the side of the commercial establishment, they will not be uh, uh, profitable. Okay, the linear rate would be most expensive rate, especially if your uh, the adjustment uh, price is very high. Okay, normally the K part here, this uh, the base rate is normally uh, equivalent to the fixed rate. Okay, but if you for example, if you go to BGC or uh, other high valued uh, Places normally the, they would imp implement the linear rate pricing. So we pre presented here the mean max rate, and you can see here that for short staying parking duration, the mean max rate would normally be almost the same as your linear rate and your fixed rate. But for short staying parking duration, as you can see here, they would normally be in between the fixed rate and the a linear rate, which uh, which would allow us to discriminate the short term and the long term parkers. Another thing here is the heuristic approaches for RSU deployment, and when we talk about RSU, it's all about the roadside unit that can be an EV charger. But for this case, uh, since I'm focused more on uh, data exchange between vehicles and infrastructures for uh, real-time uh, dissemination of data. So uh, the simple uh, approach of deployment is based on the transmission density, the data delivery efficiency, the efficiency density, and the space mean speed profile and transmission density. So we used here the data set from Beijing and we allotted or we uh, got 40 of their uh, most uh, uh, dense uh, the 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 the, the, the intersections with the most numbers of uh, cars and also based on these uh, uh, variables. So as you can see here, uh, coming from various uh, criteria, so RTD, RDDE, RED, and RASPD, you can see here that uh, based from this uh, forty intersections they will be prioritized accordingly, okay? Uh, our future work here was able to use consolidated uh, weighted mean approach in, in such a way that you can use uh, the intersections of these uh, various criteria. And, uh, another application or one of the, uh, the last applications, that last application that I'll be discussing here is the ride sharing application. In this talk, we'll just be talking about the application where in passenger where, where there are only two passengers and they share a common distance in their ride sharing. Okay. Uh, here, origin of passenger B uh, from the ori original position of passenger A should conform to the following uh, criteria here. Uh, we can change this, but for now we can we we've only set this to the following. Uh, uh, constraints. And we uh, base this on uh, benchmarking our game theory, uh, ride sharing, pricing on the solar ride. And the main objective here is hopefully you should be able to uh, uh, reduce the passenger cost okay, when you are uh, riding a taxi. The main idea here is based from our result is that okay, uh, obviously when you perform ride sharing, the number of taxi trips is reduced. And when the number of taxi trips are reduced, obviously we can help our environment recover from 
air pollution. So as we can see from our results using the Jakarta, Singapore, and the New York cases, uh, we were able to reduce our taxi trips. And this is only by using uh, two passengers at a time. Okay, And the average travel distance is also uh, reduced for each, uh, well, uh, for if we, if we have a good passenger matching, then the, there would be slight reduction okay? because as much as possible, we can pair two passengers that are uh, obviously coming from the same uh, origin and going to the same destination. Okay? And when we talk about the economics of this ride-sharing technique, in this one here, the average pair and the driver revenue, we can see that for the driver, all right, there's not much... Uh, difference, okay. Uh, it means that the uh, driver does not earn or uh, lose it, that much income when we when he allowed uh, two passengers to perform ride share. However, for the uh, passengers, it's evidently that the the passengers are able to reduce their uh, cost. So in conclusion, we have employed empirical G GPS mobility phases to investigate social and operational transportation dynamics. And uh, we have applied them to dynamic parking pricing temporally. Uh, we have also used them for roadside infrastructure de deployment and passenger ride sharing. I think uh, our results have been uh, can be utilized by sectors involved in policy making, road network improvement, and environment monitoring. But personally, uh, I wish I can have a data set that is really targeted for the Philippine setting. So, uh, moving forward, I want to have a study that deals in Metro Manila only. But having the features and the characteristics of the Jakarta. Beijing and the Singapore places, oh, and also the New York taxi places. So with that, thank you for listening. Hopefully you've learned something from it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magsino, for sharing uh, your uh, research about um, mobility dynamics. So uh, I hope we have still uh, time to listen to our last speaker. Uh, he sent a pre-recorded video. And after that, uh, we'll have a short Q&A and the giving of certificates. Thank you for staying. I really appreciate it. So uh, for a moment. Good morning, everyone. I would like to share one of our recent public. Uh, are you hearing the video clearly? Can you just say yes or click a thumbs up sign button. Yes, uh, not right, Thank you. Thank you for staying. Publications in the Journal of the Electrochemical Society entitled Bibliometrics and Current Research Trends on the Direct Carbon Solid Oxide Fuel Cells as uh, utilizing biomass as fuel. The, uh, the DCSOFCs is one of the unique solid state uh, technology that we can use to produce an, uh, to produce an alternative source of energy. It is a promising energy conversion device which can directly convert the chemical energy stored in solid carbon fuel into electricity with ultra high efficiency and low emission. Similar to other fuel cells, we use certain fuel to uh, react with oxygen and use the free electron from the reaction to produce electricity for our circuit load. In general, for DC SOFC, we use carbon based material to react with oxygen. This involves the Woodward reaction in its uh, reverse to free an electron on the anode and producing CO2 gas. The pure CO2 gas can be isolated easily and captured from the CO2 outlet, which can be used for different applications such as to feed for um, microalgae growth, which in turn can be a source, uh, as a, a source for biomass or biofuel and extract the nutrients from it for maybe partial uh, pharmaceutical applications. Uh, various research are done to improve the efficiency of the uh, DC-SOFC by varying the electrode, the electrolyte, and the design itself. 
aside from the biomass as a fuel. Now, for this paper, that's what we are going to focus on, the pyrolyzed biomass producing biochar and activating it to be used as a carbon fuel for this technology. In a tropical country like Philippines, we have a lot of waste biomass, and these are potential um, source of fuel for this technology. So it would be interesting if we if we can do that no, for uh, to achieve a circular economy. Now it is important to see who are the leading countries in this uh, technology of solid oxide fuel cells. Knowing the players in the field will help us identify the reliable contributors. We look at the publications indexed in uh, Scopus and to see this and we can see the statistical data. So at first Germany published the um, a paper on SOFC in 1963 then followed by the United States in 1987. Now, UK, United Kingdom uh, has increased their number of publications from 1997 to 2003. So they were leading during the time. After that, Japan led uh, technology development of this device from 2004 to 2014. And then from 2015 onwards, um, China is now leading uh, the number of publications in, in, this, uh, about, in developing this technology. Afterwards, we look at which countries are collaborating in the development of SOFCs and cluster them, which are indicated by the colors in this figure. So you can see United States and China, they are actually working together for this development, at least. Um, that's what our data says. Okay? And Philippines can be found or can be clustered with South Korea. It means we have more authorship being done with, um, with, uh, with this cluster. Now, the size of the names is proportional to the number of publications and the thickness of the line edges is proportional to the strength or the number of co-authored publications. And we also look at these uh, prominent researchers, uh, researchers who are developing, um, and they have the uh, most cited and co-cited uh, authors, or they're, they're, at least their their works are um, highly cited. And we can see three... Uh, dominant professors here, Professor Raymond Gorder of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Professor John Irvine of the University of St. Andrews, and Professor Zhang Yu of the South China University of Technology. Among the three, Professor Zhang Yu of the South China University of Technology leads in the development of the direct carbon solid oxide fuel cell. And in here, we can also see the common co-authors of Professor Irvine and Professor Yu working in the development of the DC SOFC. We can also see the works of Professor Liu based on the colors that their works are actually uh, well cited compared to the other authors. And then we gather the keywords used in their publications. Normally, we use the keywords to identify uh, the content or the topic of, our, uh, of, the, uh, of the publication. And then we categorize them. And from here, we can identify the um, biomass materials they used. Uh, what are the outputs that they measured and for what applications. Okay? They also look at the properties, they characterize, and what char characterization methods they used or equipment. And then they, uh, we can also see here the, the electrodes that they use, the electrolyte that they use for their DCS OFC. And of course, the reaction processes as, as well involved in the DCS OFC. Now, we will focus on the biomass that uh, they used, and we, uh, we will differentiate the, 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 the performance in this uh, DCLFC using this different biomass. Okay, so we, there are studies about the tomato peels, the kelp, citrus fruits, coconut, rice husk, corn cob, kelp, bagasse, walnut, wheat straw, and other uh, biomass sources which can be uh, pyrolyzed into a biochar. And normally, it's spiralized from 300 Celsius to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And for some, they activated it. Okay? And there are different methods for activating it. So by uh, adding catalysts, by impregnation infiltration method, or wet agglomeration method, or solid state reaction method. 
And then, of course, for characterist uh, characterizations, they look at the proximate analysis, elemental analysis, the biomass composition, the presence of uh, natural occurring catalysts in this uh, biomass. And here are the um, some of the findings. Okay? And the observed trend in the volatile matter, porosity, and structure disorder was significantly correlated with the power output of the direct carbon solid oxide fuel cells. And in this paper, spe specifically on pine charcoal, they found, in contrast, high ash and sulfur contents inhibit the electrochemical performance of the device. And so, and then the optimum performance of the DCRFC can be obtained by uh, fuel with high volatile matter, oxygen content, porosity, carbon disorder, and low amount of impurities exhibited in its low ash content. So normally, we would like to have uh, high porosity and carbon content, of course, definitely, because this is what we need. This is the fuel that we need. Um, we need the porosity uh, to, um, uh, so that we can uh, add more catalysts, more, more locations for the catalysts, and also area for uh, reaction purposes or reaction uh, sites. And in here, we can see the electrochemical performance without the activation. They use cigarette filter as the highest peak power density. After activation, pomelo peel has the highest peak power density. The open voltages are close to each other. It is worth to mention that the rice husk uh, has the highest fuel utilization after activation, while pomelo peel has the higher util uh, fuel utilization without activation. For future prospects and challenges okay, for this research okay, are the following. So, of course, we want to improve the cell performance uh, through the improvement of the body-wide reactions kinetic processes. So, we might need to adopt uh, novel catalysts or we need to optimize the amount of catalysts um, in the uh, biomass. Okay, and we can also apply some pretreatment to the biochar as well. Uh, another thing is the cost reduction strategies, which to explore the materials and methods uh, for the components of the SO, for the DCSOFC, explore different activation methods for carbon fuels, uh, explore pros and cons of activation and uh, uh, of activation methods. Okay. The uh, one of the uh, possible differences in the output would be the different methods for activation that they use. So it would be interesting. If we can um, uh, explore okay, a different uh, for the same biomass uh, with different activation methods. And lastly, the design of the DCOFC configurations for uninterrupted operation. So, when for this example, we need to uh, replenish the carbon content in the DCOFC. So, the, the, the question is uh, the design of it and basically the assembly of for continuous supply of solid carbon, reloading or, or mechanical recharging of the carbon rich fuel. So here are our conclusions. This SOFC using biochar as fuel as is at its early stage of development. And pyrolyzed biomass and activated biochar improve the performance of the technology and physical chemical properties of biomass, cells electrochemical performance and fuel utilization rate are factors to identify a good fuel for the uh, device. Overview of the potential fuel for the DCFC from biomass sources and cell performance improves when activated is used as fuel. And we have studied the gaps in these current studies and um, through the identified future prospects and challenges. And here are the references. Uh, well, just some of the references. And you can find the uh, full paper in this uh, site. Uh, well, at least you can use the DO, DOI for this. Okay. And it's an open access, so you can download it and uh, uh, read more details about the uh, paper. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay, so uh, I forgot to introduce our speaker for that uh, part. Uh, Dr. Villagracia is a research fellow, full professor and vice chair of the Department of Physics 
and head of the Advanced Nanomaterials Investigation by Molecular Simulations or Animals at the De La Salle University. He received his PhD in Physics from the La Salle University. He was a visiting researcher in Osaka University under the short course Quantum Engineering Design in 2010 and a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for 2D Materials and Graphene Research Center of Nationals, University of Singapore in 2017. And he, re he received a research scholarship grant from USA to conduct his research at the University of Arizona under Professor Dr. Joel Crello and at the University of Florida under Professor Dr. Adrian Royford in 2017 to 2018. And for this part, uh, do you have any uh, questions to our uh, speakers for this session? So, uh, let me start with uh, no, siguro, uh, Dr. Hanayro or J.I. Do you conduct uh, cross-validation of your machine learning? And uh, second question is, uh, what, uh, what what's the long-term goal? Uh, do you see the uh, potential uses of peptides in healthcare or other, uh, you know, uses? Uh, that's just two questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I perform external validation wherein I try to... Uh, find other peptide sequences reported in literature and try to apply the model there. But as I've mentioned, data, data availability is uh, really a challenge. So there are some models that I cannot really validate unless I uh, can do it uh, experimentally, which is also challenging uh, given the uh, resources we have here in, in the country. Now, the long-term view, of course, is uh, rational peptide design, wherein uh, the we can uh, design peptide sequences based on the targeted uh, properties. So yun yung uh, overall view. Uh, I just have a question for uh, Dr. Vejerano, if uh, I can uh, ask now or Mamaya. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, he's here with us. I am here. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just the other day, uh, my lesson in class is about photosynthesis and your uh, 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 presentation can, can add more depth in my discussion about photosynthesis. But uh, my question is, uh, plants have a mechanism, right, on how to quench these radicals. So for example, there, there's catalase, there's peroxisome. So do yeah. you think uh, these persistent radicals have a way of evading this uh, internal mechanisms of the plants to quench these radicals? Uh that I don't know, I mean, to be uh, direct. So I think the one that I presented a while ago in explaining, you know, the possible uh, role of these free radicals are just a speculative. So that I only extracted it from the study done recently in Published in Nature, that, you know, the chloroplast is a very leaky structure. And before we did not uh, think that that's how, that the chloroplast is not leaky. Now we know that it's leaky. So now the persistent free radicals might actually be a mechanism to um, to serve as electron quenchers mm -hmm. from this uh, electron tunneling inside the chloroplast. Now, in terms of um, other structure like catalase deactivating the persistent free radicals, that might also be possible. But if it's quenching, if this uh, compounds in plants like peroxisome or catalase is actually deactivating it, then we should not see any persistent free radicals in leaves at all. So in the mere fact that they're still there, even uh, while they are senescent or uh, as in non-senescent leaves and even more so in senescent leaves suggests that they are very stable inside the leaves and they are not uh, quenched at ordinary conditions in, uh, in leaves. So, but I think to some extent they might, but um, uh, still a huge uh, concentration, like 10 to the 16 molecules of that radical per gram of leaves. So that's still a lot uh, in the leaves. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. your question. But I'm not really, I'm, by the way, I'm not a photosynthesis expert. I'm an air quality guy. So I'm just dipping my toes on photosynthesis. <laughs> no, but but, uh, but your uh, presentation, your results were uh, very interesting. And I intend to read more about that and probably can incorporate in uh, some of my future uh, lessons in class. Yeah. So And by the way, I'm also looking for collaborators. 
I'm trying to uh, isolate this compound. Now, this is a radical, it's persistent, but with I tried to extract some of it. And I think I would need like tons of leaves to actually get a pure uh, material of that material of this. Hello, I think he got disconnected, sir. Thank you. That, that that's all uh, for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doctor Beherano, do you hear us? Okay. For Doctor uh, Magsino, sir, do you have um uh, mobility dynamics data if you compare pre-COVID and COVID uh, situation? Yes, I'm just curious. Uh, oh, well. One there of the would be people... changes. Uh, definitely, there would be, but yeah, we have uh, yeah. insights uh, regarding the, that uh, particular data, pre-COVID well, and COVID. Well, well, one of the major issues of uh, empirical mobility data sets would always be privacy. Oh, yeah. The the, the basing data sets that we got for my PhD was dated, if I'm not mistaken, 2005. Mm -hmm. 2005 or 2015. So imagine that they are only willing to share their data set freely if it is not within this a certain 10 year time period. frame yeah <laughs> yeah so for for the new york data sets a data set i only got the uh, origin and the destination so basically there's no trajectory in it in the singapore and uh, jakarta well i thought well they gave me the trajectories but this is also pre covid so, but however, when I got the Manila data set, I got this, well, I, I was able to ask them for the pre-COVID December 16. And that's the only day that they were able to give me. So I, I think it, it would always be the major issue there of the privacy. And I think the grab data set of Jakarta and Singapore, well, this is my only uh, assumption because I just base it on the data set that they have gave me for the Philippine data set that uh, the, the, the trajectory is there, but uh, somehow it's very much uh, revised or uh, they have already uh, edited the trajectories for privacy and security reasons, which is very much understandable. So are, but the, the data set pre-COVID and after COVID, after COVID, I did not, uh, during COVID, I also did, did not have any data set. But that. are we allowed to incorporate uncertainties so, so that you can conduct sensitivity analysis just for simulation purposes? Can, can you do that uh, in your model? Yeah. Well, since I'm uh, using empirical data sets, I just rely on what's there. Mm -hmm. And somehow for the Jakarta and the Singapore, uh, we did some visual inspection to make sure that uh they did not really remove that much data. Okay. Okay. So in terms of sensitivity, we haven't done that yet because at the end of the day, uh, if we have this data set which are really uh lacking uh at first, then whatever methods that we use would somehow, as we feel, will not give us really the correct data. But uh, we just always claim that our results are based on the data sets that we have. And I think that's one of the future thrusts that I would want to do in the Philippines, that uh, we want to understand what's really happening to the transportation network in the Philippines, particularly in the jeepneys, uh, railroads, and the taxis. And hopefully when we have these data sets, we can really claim it to be our own and not just relying on other third-party just like Grab provider to yeah. give us yes to give us the data sets. Yeah, Thank that would be interesting if you will apply that to uh, tricycles and yes, uh, uh, basically it's it would be a joint or yeah. a joint uh, transportation analysis. That's great. For Doctor Vejerano, sir, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, do we need to have some? Uh, I'm not sure of the term, but technological interventions for free radicals or. Uh, you know, what are we doing? Uh, we need some uh, interventions with regards to uh, the health effects. 
or it's not uh, it's not yet that alarming <laughs> well it's always been uh you know uh, persistent free radical is as old as uh humans discovering fire so it's always been there but uh, in the United States, there is a drive that, you know, to make EPFRs as part of these priority pollutants, okay. like PM2.5, EPFR. So LSU is doing this uh, massive NIH project to push that, but I think they still need to acquire um, data, real online, real on ta um, real time data on the uh, concentration of EPFRs. Right now, the, the bottleneck is that so difficult to measure the free radicals in PM because if you need to do um, high volume sampling and if you do small sampling to do real time, there's no instrument right now to actually detect the low level of uh, concentration. But to protect yourself from uh, the hazards of EPFR is the same as protecting yourself from COVID. You need identified mask because you know they're very efficient in preventing um, particles, especially around 300 nanometer particle. And mm -hmm. because EPFRs are mainly incorporated in combustion size nanoparticle, which is around 200 nanometers. So if you wear a mask, so that will substantially um, reduce the uh, impact of, uh, of EPFRs and not just EPFRs, you know, just improving health uh, quality, um, hair quality. And you know, in the Philippines, because I'm I'm in the Philippines right now, so sorry for the, <laughs> no you know, the Wi-Fi problems or the <laughs> city down in PLDT. So there's just you know tons of a PM two point five. So I think I've been hailed tons of a PM two point five <laughs> right now in uh, my two weeks stay in the Philippines as compared You're to still adjusting. one year stay. <laughs> <laughs> so much PM two point five <laughs> inhaling. So to protect yourself from air quality, you know PM two point five and ninety five. I think. Especially if you're in the city or UPLB, just you know, mass is really yeah a good uh simple technology technical intervention. Intervention. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, thank you everyone for interesting talks and discussion. So thank you for staying. So we had some uh, technical difficulties or even schedule difficulties. So uh, let's proceed with uh, awarding of certificates. So same certificate. Uh, will be given to all the uh, oral speakers. Let's start with uh, the certificate of appreciation is awarded to in grateful acknowledgement for imparting uh, their valuable knowledge and insights as this time an oral speaker in the 2020, 2023 annual Paase meeting and symposium with the theme reimagining the training of the 21st century STEAM workforce held from June 26 to July 1, 2023. Signed, Dr. Mariano R. Santo Domingo, PASI President and 43rd APAMS co-convenor with Dr. Sinia Tigno, 43rd APAMS co-convenor. So a round of applause for Dr. Alreci Villagracia. Next would be Dr. Jose Isagani Hanayro. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. J.I. And uh, next would be Dr. Eric P. Beherano. Uh, welcome to uh, the Philippines again, sir. And uh, Dr. Elmer R. Ibuancino. So, okay. So, uh, again, uh, this is your host, uh, Michael Francis Benjamin or Benja. Thank you for attending 6 and 7 Advances in Materials and Manufacturing, Bio Nanotechnology, Environmental Science, Transportation, Dynamics. Hopefully, we can still watch the other parts of the uh, APAMS 2023. So take care, everyone. See you. Thank you. Thank you.